Planning Your Installation In this nugget we're going to talk about the issues involved in planning a Linux installation. Now there are options for everything from which Linux distribution you choose to what software you install and I'll help you decide what makes sense for your particular situation. So let's get started. When you're preparing to do an installation, one of the first questions you have to ask yourself is what's the purpose of the computer that you're installing? Is it a personal workstation, like is it going to sit on your desk at home and just function as a standalone computer? Or is it going to be in some lab at a university and be networked with other computers? That kind of thing. Uh, is it going to be a server, like an email server or a web server? Uh, is it going to be a dedicated server? Is it going to function as other things as well? And you just have to determine like what the load that's going to be placed on this computer is. And generally servers have a higher load than workstations, so they have a little bit beefier hardware, like more memory, faster disks, that kind of stuff. We'll talk more about hardware in the next video. Uh, and then what's the other purpose of a computer? Who knows? I mean, computers do all sorts of things nowadays. Like uh, maybe it's controlling the manufacturing process at some plant. Or maybe you're recycling some old workstation uh, to serve as a router today. And a 10-year-old workstation could work perfectly fine as a modern-day router. Okay? So once you decide on what the purpose of your computer is, then the next thing you have to do is decide which operating system to use. And the way I've listed it here is just Linux versus other proprietary operating systems. Uh, maybe when I say the word proprietary, the first thing that pops to your mind is Microsoft. But, you know, Microsoft and Linux couldn't be more different. Like comparing these is like comparing apples and oranges. Uh, actually, it's more like comparing apples and asparagus, you know, fruits and vegetables. Just a completely different class of, of operating system. Microsoft's dominant in the home computing industry. It's dominant in the office computing. Okay, and Linux is more in the scientific computing uh, world, and, and the servers uh, are running Linux more often. Okay, so, so like I said, these just couldn't be more different operating systems. Uh, the people that are using Microsoft are not very computer savvy necessarily. Uh, you know, they, they, maybe they want the operating system to do a lot of stuff for them so they don't have to worry about it. But all that behind the scenes stuff drives Linux users nuts. They'd rather control every, every last uh, aspect of what the operating system is doing. Okay, so like I said, they just couldn't be more different. Now, if you're using Linux in some sort of, you know, organization where everyone else is using Microsoft, you're going to be fighting a little bit of an uphill battle, right? Because all those Microsoft users, you know, they're, they're commonly shipping files around and sharing files. And just because they're running the same operating system and the same software, it's easy for them to share files. But when they ship you off some Excel document, it's going to be a pain in the butt for you to deal with that all the time. And, you know, there's emulators out there that, you know, emulate certain Microsoft programs but, but you know they, they don't work so well and it's just that's just not the way you want to use Linux emulating Microsoft all the time all right so so you know a better choice would be just to abandon all the Microsoft software altogether and just run your Linux box but like I said if you're in some sort of a Microsoft organization that's going to be tough to do and, and you're going to be fighting a little bit of an uphill battle there and people say that Microsoft is Linux's biggest competitor, but I don't really see that. Like I said, this is, you know, they're appealing to a different set of people and they're just used in different circumstances. So I don't really see them as competitors necessarily. What I see as a bigger competitor for Linux are commercial Unix vendors. Uh, a vendor like Sun has Solaris and uh, Silicon Graphics has Irix. And these are just, uh, you know, flavors of Unix. And, and people are buying these even though these are quite expensive and Linux is out there for practically free. Okay, but the reason that people are, are still buying these commercial products is because, you know, they're high performance or they, they work better in certain situations and, and you know, they're, they're just more highly tuned for, for certain settings. And, and Linux, you know, every day is just stepping on these guys' toes just a little bit more and more. And it'll be interesting to see how this all plays out in 10 or 20 years. You know, how is the Microsoft versus Linux thing going? How is Linux versus Unix going? Are these guys just out of business? Are they lowering their prices? Have they somehow squashed the free software movement? Movement. You know, who knows how this is all going to play out. I suspect that Linux will, will hang in there. I suspect that commercial Unix vendors will, will slowly, uh, you know, start offering their products for cheaper and cheaper, maybe even free. Who knows? We'll see how all this plays out in 10 or 20 years. Now, once you decide that Linux is your operating system, which I'm assuming you have if you're watching these videos, uh, then the next thing you have to do is decide which Linux distribution that you want to use. I've listed four distributions here just because they each have some notable characteristic, but there's easily like five or ten more I can name off the top of my head that, you know, people like to use and are, are very, very good versions of Linux. Okay, I've, like I said, I've just listed each of these because they have some notable characteristic. For Red Hat, it's probably the most popular uh, version of Linux that's out there. Okay, and because it's popular, it's, it's pretty good to get support on, either through, uh, you know, the, the company itself, through Red Hat, or through other people because there's lots of people that use it. Uh, there's news groups out there so you can get help on those news groups, more informal sort of help.
Okay, so it's popular, it has support. Also, Red Hat has quite a number of graphical user interface tools uh, for the installation process and for configuring various services on the, on the computer. Okay, so that, that's what differentiates Red Hat. Uh, Debian is probably the most stable version of Linux out there. When I worked at that internet company, uh, we had Debian on all our servers. They were, you know, serving up millions of pages a day, and, and Debian was just rock solid. It never crashed. All right, so, the, so that's probably the most stable version out there. Uh, SUSE, or SUSE, some people call it, uh, is, it can be distributed on DVD, and it also can come with tons of software. Uh, and so if some of that software appeals to you then, and you have a DVD player on, on your system, then maybe SUSE is the, is the version of Linux that you should try out. This is probably the most popular version of Linux in Europe right now. And then another end of the extreme is Slackware. Slackware is probably the oldest of any Linux distribution going. Uh, you know, there's no graphical user interfaces. This is probably like, you know, the most pure version of Linux in some sense. So if you, if you want the, lin the purest Linux experience, uh, Slackware would be the way to go. And what I want to do now is just show you where you can get all these and, and various other distributions that are out there. Let me just show you uh, where you can get some of those distributions that we were just talking about. I'm going to open up the Mozilla web browser here by clicking on that little red horse head. And uh, the Mozilla web browser is, you know, probably the most popular web browser in Linux. You could certainly use Netscape or something too if you'd rather. Um, let's go to www.linux.org. Okay, and at linux.org you'll see a site, a section down here called distributions. I'll click on that, and uh, and and you know there's a little bit of history here. Let's talk about that before we go down and look at the actual distributions and where you can get them. Uh, this guy Linus Torvalds is the guy who wrote Linux, and he wrote it back in '91. Okay, and he basically wrote the core of Linux, the kernel, which is like the the main part of Linux. Some new tools were added on. Uh, GNU is this company, it's or this organization. GNU's not Unix is what that stands for, and you know they wrote stuff for Unix systems but they were independent of any Unix vendor okay and and he got those some of those tools to work on Linux and then eventually people just started adding on to Linux and you know and it's got to the point where it's come to today well what happened was you know once people started adding on to it then people said well let me distribute my version of Linux because I've added this really cool new feature and then somebody else said well I don't want that I want this and then somebody else would distribute that and that's sort of how all these various distributions started coming about you know the core of Linux is still you know based on Linus's stuff Okay, uh, and, but it, it doesn't matter which Linux you're talking about, but um, there's various distributions out there and there's all these companies that formed to distribute those distributions and, and uh, you know, add on to them and add some new features and graphical user interfaces and stuff like that. And those companies like Red Hat and Suzy and Caldera and Mandrake, okay, they're, they're all out there trying to make money off Linux and they're doing a good job at it. Uh, whereas the, an organization like Debian, okay, that's a nonprofit organization that's distributing Linux. Very different situation, okay? Um, and, and you know, you just need to decide wh which ones you're going to like, which one you're going to use, and and this is a good search tool to to help you decide because it's not just like based on preference; it's based on like technical stuff. Like, um, you know, uh, like first let's look at the platform thing. If you have an Intel compatible computer, then every Linux out there is going to run on that because that's what it was originally written on. Um, but if you have a PowerPC or an Alpha or a Spark or something, then you're not going to have as many choices. So you should definitely search if you've got one of these kinds and not an Intel you know search uh, for that and you'll see you have a restricted set of choices of which kind of uh, Linux you can run on your system and then under category here it just lists you know uh, various things like the Red Hat based Debian based Slackware based uh, you know security enhanced Linux mainstream Linux that kind of stuff okay so you know that might not be too important to you but um, you know certainly the platform is important and the language is important uh, if you don't speak English or something then you have to find you're probably not listening to to me now either but uh, you know then that's going to restrict your options as well okay so let's just do a search here let's say uh, we're gonna go for Debian based and we're gonna say Intel compatible and let's see what it can find okay so uh, it does the search and and down here it's li lists all the options okay there's this one there's alt Linux which is uh, what a friend of mine uses and you know there's the website there's the download locations Corel Linux is another popular one there's the website you can actually buy it right here off of uh, off of amazon.com right now uh, there's books about Corel Linux there's download locations okay so you can get all this stuff right off the web um, another cool uh, here's the Debian Linux one and again Debian Linux also has books out there Another cool site, to, to, if you have a CD burner and a pretty fast internet connection, uh, you can go to linuxiso.org. 
okay? And LinuxISO.org, it's just run by a couple guys. Uh, so they're shelling the money out of their pocket for the uh, web servers and stuff. I think what they're doing though is they're not, they don't actually host all these different ISO images, like, uh, which is just like the CD image. Uh, th they don't host them all and download them themselves. I think they redirect you to a, a, a website uh, that each of these organizations hosts, okay? But um, basically, if you have a CD burner and a fast internet connection, you can burn yourself a CD of any of these uh, Linuxes here, Slackware, Red Hat, Debian, Caldera, whatever. You can just go ahead and burn yourself a, a CD image of, um, uh, of that distribution, and you can have your own distribution for the price of uh, your internet connection and, a, uh, and, and the price of a blank CD. Okay, so uh, you know that that's another way to get it. Another place that you might look is uh, www.linuxmall.com. Okay, and they've got a bunch of stuff there. And uh, if you scroll down here, you'll see uh, there's Red Hat 7.2 for 60 bucks. Okay, um, there's uh, there's Turbo Linux uh, 6.0 for uh, for ten dollars. Okay, so I mean this is cheap, right? This is cheap stuff, and Red Hat's got like a lot of support for it. Uh, over here, you can see, you know, you can get a, the, the actual. Uh, or where is it? Oh, over here. The uh, the stuffed penguin for 36 inch stuffed penguin is more than the Linux distribution. Okay, so uh, you know that's what they're selling here at the mall. You know, if you want a little stuffed penguin to sit on top of your computer, you're going to pay more for that than you're going to pay for the actual distribution, which is kind of ironic, right? So uh, so you know, just decide which one's best for you. Uh, and, and when we go to do the installation, I have a Red Hat CD. I'm going to, going to be installing it off there. But you know, if you download it and trying to install it uh, from the download, it's going to be pretty much the same process once you get it going. So, so don't worry too much about what media you're going to install it from. It's all pretty much the same. There's different licenses that can govern the software that you get in Linux, and, and I want to just go over these a little bit. Um, basically, let me give you a little bit of history. Back in the late 80s and early 90s, there was a foundation called the Free Software Foundation. And the Free Software Foundation, the point of the, the, their, their movement was that you know we were going to create this big body of software. It was going to be free. People could take the software, look at the source code for it, uh, and, and modify it and do things with it, and, and you know build up this huge uh, base of, of free software. Okay, and, and for the most part, you know, it succeeded, right? I mean, we got a lot of, of software, like the GNU uh, project and stuff like that. It's a huge amount of software. The Linux kernel that Linus Torvalds wrote was, was released under the free software movement. Uh, the, the, licenses, the license for that was the GPL, or the General Public License. And this was like the original license for the Free Software Foundation movement. Uh, also, the LGPL was part of that, the Library uh, General Public License. And basically, what the license for this said was that you know, we'll, you know, they build up a huge body of source code, all these tools and routines for people to use. And the, 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 the trick was, or the, the, the trade-off was that if you use this stuff to build some other piece of software, then you had to release your new piece of software also under the general public license. Okay, you couldn't take their code, modify it, and then release some commercial product with it. Okay, and that seemed kind of fair, right? Because the the Free Software Foundation was founded on, you know, here we build all this stuff up. We're contributing to the community. We're giving all this free labor and and free time and and free source code to the community. You can take this as long as you, in turn, give free software back to the community. Okay, so it was it was definitely like this community-driven uh, uh, organization, the Free Software Foundation. Now there were other licenses that governed software back then. The MIT uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology license uh, that governed the X Windows system. That's where it was written, uh, and that's uh, even less restrictive than the GPL. Uh, the MPL, the Mozilla Public License, was for the Mozilla web browser. Again, that was a very specific license just for Mozilla. But the point was there was lots of sort of splintering off here of licenses just for various. You you know, tr different, uh, you know, opinions of, of what exactly the, the license should cover, okay? And sometime in the mid-90s, uh, there was a severe splintering of, of this whole uh, Free Software Foundation open source movement. And some people spun off on it, and basically they made up a new set of rules here. And the rules, you know, I've just listed a few here, but they basically listed out, I don't know, 10 or 12 rules or something. And, and the rules, you know, definitely included things like free redistribution of the software, okay, and source availability. But they also said things like the modifications of the software, if somebody takes it and modifies it, the, the modifications can be released under other licenses. So, so someone could take this license or take this software that was, that was free and modify it and then, you know, do something different with it. It's not free software anymore. Okay, so, so that's a little bit tricky, right? I mean, um, you know, it, it just makes things a little bit tricky and it definitely splintered off the groups. And this, I think, was the main sticking point there. And I don't want to get into this too much. The main thing here is, uh, you know, this 
mostly affects developers, people that are writing code, they see code out there, they want to modify it and do something with it. Uh, th this mostly affects them, and if they're going to do that, and if they're going to try and make money off of it, you better be really careful because they better fall under certain license classifications and not other ones. And, and you know, consult a lawyer or something. I'm not the person to talk to about the nuances of this. Um, but I just want to get the, the terms out there, the GPL terms, the open source terms. And then the other alternative, obviously, is commercial software. Uh, commercial software has closed source. They don't show you the source code behind the software. Uh, distribution limitations. Uh, you know, I can't take my Microsoft Office disk and install it on my computer and then turn around and give it to you legally and let you install it on your computer. Right? That, that's breaking the distribution laws of Microsoft. Uh, and typically commercial software is payment. All right? But there's a lot of gray area in between this whole free software, commercial software, open source software the classifications. Like, like take Star Office for instance. Star Office is free. Like you can download it for free and install it on your computer and you know great it's free software but it still is closed source they're not showing you the source code behind star office so you know what's the deal is that free software is a commercial software I don't know I don't know how you'd classify it but the point is the, the there, it's not as easy to draw the lines and say this is free software, this is commercial software like it was back in 1990. And I don't know if that's better or worse than it was. Uh, there's definitely more software available now to you. There's still a hell of a lot of free software out there for you to put on your Linux machine. So in some sense, I don't think it's gotten any worse just because there's more people involved in the movement now uh, than there was back then. But just be aware that if some developer comes to you as a system administrator and says, hey, I've done this and I'm going to do this and this with this software that I've modified, uh, you know, be careful careful about that. Don't let them uh don't let them do that under certain license conditions and like I said consult a lawyer if you're if you're confused because it's not it's not the room for uh computer people, that's the room for lawyers there. Now let's talk about software available for Linux. Let's open up Mozilla web browser again. And and you know there's tons of good software out there for Linux for all sorts of applications. Let's go to this website called linuxsoftware.org. Okay, and linuxsoftware.org has all sorts of stuff. You can see the classification here for software programs. You know, there's 422 total programs in these categories. Uh, everything from file compression utilities to games to, to full-on Linux distributions like Debian and Red Hat and Slackware are available here for download. And some of the things are free. Uh, mo a lot of them are free. Some of them cost money. You know, and you, and you can see that when you, when you pull up the various tools, what, what, what's up with them. Uh, and, you know, earlier when we were talking about uh, Linux versus Windows, I was saying, you know, if you have a Linux machine, you're kind of fighting an uphill battle in terms of software. Well, you're not fighting an uphill battle in terms of like the available software that you have on Linux. Uh, if you're just running some standalone Linux computer, you've got tons of choices, uh, sometimes even more than, than on uh, Windows machines. And, and you know, you've got tons of choices out there to do whatever you need to do. Where you're fighting a little bit of an uphill battle is if you've got like a Linux machine and everybody else in your office has Windows machines. When I was a professor, that was my situation. I had a Unix box, everybody else had Windows boxes, and they'd be running, you know, like Excel, and they'd send me some Excel spreadsheet and want me to read it, and, and that was a real pain in the butt because I had to like save it and try to go over to some Windows machine in the lab and try to look at it, and, and it was just kind of a pain. It got old really fast. Okay, so so um, you know that's the only time you're fighting the uphill battles when you're trying to share files between uh, the Windows platform and the Linux platform. Let's go under productivity tools here, uh, and you know you can see a whole bunch of stuff here: fax tools, financial tools, Office applications. Let's go into Office applications, and when we go in there, uh, let's go to Office Suites. Okay, so here's Office Suites that are available for Linux. Andrew is a very mature uh, Office Suite. Uh, and it's got word processors, editors, spreadsheets, all sorts of stuffs in in Andrew. Uh, Applixware is another one that's you know it's got all sorts of stuff. Um, you know word processors again, spreadsheets, uh, drawing programs. K Office is another one, and this is an integrated Office suite for the K desktop environment. And again, spreadsheets, uh, word processors, drawing programs, uh, draw charts and diagrams, formula editors, all sorts of stuffs here. Okay, so uh, you know there's no shortage of office suites available for Linux. But like I said, the problem is when you're trying to interact. And uh, one noteworthy uh, piece of software there is Star Office, and Star Office is Microsoft Office compatible. So, you know, somebody should be able to run uh, Excel or whatever on their computer, send you some Excel document, and you should be able to open it on Star Office on your Linux computer and, you know, save, you know, read the file, write it, save it, give it back to them, and they should be able to open it and read it and so on. Okay? Now, I'm always a little bit leery of things that say so and so compatible. Right? I've always run into problems with that. You know, they're compatible in 90% of the situations, but there's always those, uh, you know, extraneous things that, that make them not, not be compatible. 
Okay, so so you know if it was up to me and I was running this office and there was you know some Linux users, some Windows users, and people wanted to share files, I would get everybody to install Star Office because Star Office runs on Linux machines, it runs on Windows machines, and uh, and then the compatibility issue is not an issue, right? It's definitely going to work because it's the same program on both machines and it's just running on two different platforms. But in that situation, that's fine. We can definitely share files in that situation and everything's going to work because it's the same program. And like I said. I'm always a little bit leery of this so-and-so compatible stuff. Uh, and, and, you know, you just need to decide for your situation. You know, if, if what you're doing with, with Office is compatible between Star Office and Microsoft Office, then, you know, maybe you should just leave well enough alone and let people use what they got and, and do it that way. Uh, you know, it's up to you. You just have to decide what's best for you. You'll, there'll be people out there that'll say, well, Star Office is so inferior to Microsoft Office, and I'm not going to get into that. You just have to decide, is this good enough for what you want to do? And if it is, then you can make your decisions appropriately. Uh, let me back up a couple levels here, um, again, to the productivity tools. And, you know, there's fax tools, there's financial tools, like little accounting tools. Uh, one that's in there that's noteworthy is GNU Cash. Uh, and, again, it's just like your little personal accountant. Uh, let's back up again. Uh, there's fax tools. There's mathematical graphing tools. And once you start getting into scientific applications, uh, you know, Linux, I think, beats Microsoft Windows hands down here. Uh, there's more, definitely more scientific and, and mathematical tools available on Linux than there is on Windows. They're just, you know, more superior. Linux machines are generally, uh, you know, it, Linux is just usually more robust and, and it just handles those, you know, number crunching type of applications much better than the Windows machines do. Uh, so, you know, when you go into some like university and you go into like the physics department, you'll see more Linux machines there than you'll see in the history department or the English department, just because the demands that the physicists and the mathematicians place on computers is a little more so than the, than the history people and the, and the English people and stuff like that. Okay, so, so if that's your game is science and scientific applications, Linux is going to be a good choice and there's going to be tons of software there for Linux that, that the Windows people will be envious of. All right, and uh, you know, get, let's back up another level from productivity tools. Let's go to network and internet tools. And under there, you can see a bunch of various things: uh, FTP clients, uh, mail tools, server tools, web browser tools. Uh, let's go under server tools. And under server tools, you can see all sorts of stuff: web server statistics tools, and actually just web servers. And under web servers, uh, the first thing here is Apache. And this this is the stuff. I mean, Apache web server running under Linux is probably the most stable uh, web server environment that you could that you could have there just isn't anything better when I worked at that internet company we had Debian Linux we had Apache web server running on that all this free software and the stuff just never never crashed I mean it just ran all the time served millions and millions of hits all, you know a day and it was just it was just bomb proof um, and you can see here there's been some survey that you know 58 percent or so of the web servers on the internet are using Apache so more than all other web servers combined right I mean that that's a tall claim and this is free software and this is just it just it's just killer. Uh, and there's all sorts of, uh, you know, tools or add-ons to Apache to do various things. And, and it's very easy to use, very easy to set up. And, and like I said, this is just the, the, the stuff. Uh, and if we go back further, um, all the way back to the top again, you'll see, you know, all sorts of stuff in here. Just browse around for what you need. Uh, and there's almost surely some Linux program out there for it. And like I said, the only time you're ever going to run into a problem is that when you try to interact with, like, Microsoft stuff. And in that case, you know, you just need to find software that, that bridges that gap that runs on both platforms and then you'll be fine. Time to wrap up our installation planning nugget. In, in this video we talked about uh, you know basically the software side of things and in the next nugget we'll cover uh, installation planning from the hardware perspective. So first we talked about the various Linux distributions that you could choose from, uh, you know Red Hat or Debian or, or Slackware or whatever and, and you know tried to give you an idea of what each one was good for and what, what it was notorious for uh, and you know use that search tool on Linux.org to help you find the one that meets your specific needs. And then we talked about uh, software for Linux, like, you know, the various office applications and mathematical applications, that kind of stuff, and just showed you where to get them at linuxsoftware.org. And there's certainly other places you can get software for Linux. Uh, you know, just do a search in your favorite uh, internet search engine and look for Linux software in some, of some variety, and you'll find all sorts of hits out there. And finally, I just tried to wrap up and give you a little idea of what goes on with the licenses in Linux, what, how, what, what the, what's up with those free licenses, what do they really mean. And you don't really have to worry too much about this as a, as a system administrator. It's mostly for developers. Well, I hope you found this nugget informative and thanks again for viewing.